actually our third learning event that we we're running is the DBG funded by the National Lottery Community Fund. So thank you for taking the time to register and to join the webinar. Um, it's great that we've had so many people sign up to this event, even though I'm sure everybody is maybe a little bit sick of Zoom. Um, but we're really excited about this event. It's tackling a difficult and a relatively new subject in our sector and one that we think is really important. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. So please do use your hand and the chat function to ask questions and do get involved in the conversation. We, we're really hoping that this event will kind of encourage conversations and we would like people to try and take part. Um, if you do have technical issues, um, either direct message Bond or myself and we'll try and get it sorted um, during the event. Um, and then a last note, we do have some people using BSL interpreters, so um, try not to speak very, very fast. Um, lastly, just a massive thank you to Julian and Gina from Chance for Childhood and Julian from CBM, who have worked massively hard over the last month or so to put this event together. So I will hand over to Julian now, who will introduce the event properly and walk us through the agenda. Thank you very much, Lauren. Uh, this event is something that um, we've been looking forward to for some time. Um, my name's Julian Eaton. I work for CBM Global, uh, and also I'm here really representing the uh, Bond uh, Mental Health and Psychosocial Disabilities subgroup of DDG. So as a group, we've been around now for a little while, for two or three years, um, and have really framed our work within Bond as part of that um, DDG group. One of the things that has come up um, many times in the in the journey that I think global mental health has had over the last 20 or so years has been this intersection with mental health and mental health in development as being a public health agenda, while also being having a very, very strong disability narrative. And sometimes those two different areas have clashed. And there is an enormous amount of interest in mental health at the moment, which has really been emphasized even more um, during COVID. And that is something that I think many of the members of Bond, and particularly members of Bond DDG, have been thinking about how they can engage in that space. But I think there's a lot of confusion and a lot of uncertainty and concern to get things right. So really based on the opportunity that we had of this series of webinars and some of those concerns and questions that were coming out of the Bond group, we really wanted to provide this opportunity to have a discussion among ourselves as Bond members about this, this, um, this element of our, of our sector. We wanted to frame it really as something that was a safe space in a way for people to express their, what, to tell us what they're doing in their organization, to be able to express problems that they're having or challenges that they're having, as well as of course, the positive experiences they've had in working in that space. So we have a fantastic set of um, panelists and a speaker who I'll introduce in a minute, um, who are going to briefly introduce us to some of those issues, but actually mainly we want to hear from you. We want to have the opportunity to understand what your work is in some of those subsectoral spaces that we've, we've um, put uh, into the agenda. So we're gonna hear first from Michael Njenga, um, who's from Kenya, who uh, is uh, a member of the, um, of the Pan-African Network of, of um, people with psychosocial disabilities, as well as working very actively uh, in Kenya in this space. He's someone who's done a lot of work with IDA, the World Network of Users and Survivors, and is really an Im important voice uh, in this space. We then have a set of panelists who I'll introduce later, who are going to take us through some initial thinking around uh, gender, uh, childhood, uh, older age and people on the move. Again, before an opportunity for us to um, discuss it together, uh, and then we'll be moving into these breakout groups uh, within which we have a good amount of time to, to discuss these things in more detail, chaired by those people who introduced the topic in the panel. But really, we don't want them to be um, talking that much more about their expertise, but to be to be facilitating a conversation among the people who've joined those groups, probably because they have some interest and, and knowledge in, in that area. Before we start, I just want everyone to note that we are recording this session. 
I hope that's okay with everyone. We felt it was valuable as a resource for us to be able to use later. Um, if that's not okay for anyone, I'm afraid uh, we probably need to um, ask you to, to leave, but I'm sure that's um, something that people are quite used to with Zoom now. It just allows us to, to substantially increase the number who, of people who can benefit from, from this meeting. Uh, I'm not going to say much more because I'll end up treading on Michael's toes and I don't want to do that. Uh, so I'll, I'll hand over at this stage um, to Michael and Jenga who's just going to give us a, a broad introduction to some of the ways that, that mental health and psychosocial disability uh, intersect with the broader disability sector. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, thank you very much, Julian, and also the Bond Group uh, for the invitation to be able to participate in this particular meeting. Um, I think I'll be speaking a lot about the work which I've done, uh, looking at the intersection between uh, mental health and psychosocial disability, uh, but also as a self-advocate, as a, as, as a person who has lived experiences. I think um, I would want to start, first of all, from this historical document that we call the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and just say that for me, the CRPD is not a document which is about disability. I normally say that this is about a theory, it's about a theory of justice as applied to persons with disabilities who historically have been marginalized, excluded, and have not been able to participate in our societies on an equal basis with others. And I think for me, what is very, very core in terms of the convention is the paradigm shift that um, is created or was created by the CRPD. And I think the first important thing is that, of course, the convention moves from treating persons with psychosocial disabilities from objects to subjects before the law, which means that they have rights and responsibilities before the law. I think the second important thing is that the convention is about restoring voice, power, and choice to persons with psychosocial disability. Because I think more than often, um, we've had situations where, for example, professionals speak on behalf of persons with disabilities. Uh, we have, for example, within an African context, families speak on behalf of persons with disabilities. And for me, I see this as a tool of restoring voice, power, and choice. And this is very, very important to us, creating pathways or forging pathways to independent living and being included in the community. So I think in essence then the CRPD reaffirms the dignity and the personhoods of persons with psychosocial disabilities. And I think it is important to say that the convention does not create new rights for persons with psychosocial disability, but rather introduces new concepts. And, and, and for example, if we look at the convention, uh, one of the most important thing is, for example, reasonable accommodation and the way it is defined in the convention. And the fact that also the convention categorically states that denial of reasonable accommodation can constitute to discrimination. I think that for very, very, is very important. I think secondly, is the whole issue of legal capacity and the way this is constructed in article 12 of the convention. And I think, historically persons with psychosocial disabilities have been disproportionately affected in terms of their right to exercise legal capacity on an equal basis with others. And I think in Article 12, um, the convention is very, very clear that persons with psychosocial disabilities, just like all other persons, have the right have the capacity to hold the rights and they have the capacity, capacity to exercise and act on those particular rights. So it's just not a question of saying that they have the right to vote. It's also going a step further and saying that they also have the capacity to exercise those particular rights and putting an obligation on the state in terms of what kind of measures do we require to ensure, for example, for persons with psychosocial disabilities are able to participate in political processes on an equal basis with others. And I think most importantly is also the fact that 
in the general comment number one of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, it lays down the distinction between legal capacity and mental capacity, which normally in the course of uh, our work, working with working in the area of mental health and working with people with psychosocial disabilities, normally people confuse this particular concept, whereas legal capacity um, is the capacity to hold rights and to exercise those particular rights, which all persons with psychosocial disabilities enjoy. Mental capacity is the decision-making capability of every person. And we have to admit that all of us make decisions in very, very different ways, whether we have a disability or not. I think most importantly is also the way the convention views disability because the convention does not uh, explicitly define what disability is, but rather talk about in Article 1, who, who, I mean, who are persons with disabilities. And this is because disability in the convention is perceived as an evolving uh, concept. And that is why the convention actually does not define that. I think notwithstanding that, it is important to appreciate the role that um, organizations of persons with psychosocial disabilities played in the negotiations of the CRPD, specifically through the World Network of Users and Survivors of Psychiatry, and most importantly, their contribution uh, in specific articles like Article 12 on the right to legal capacity, Article 12, Article 14 on liberty and security of person, Article 19 uh, on living independently and being included in the community, Article 25 on health. And I think, uh, of course, the whole discussion around, about community-based uh, mental health services and the, the, the right to make free and informed decision are, are, are very, very core. And it's one of the most contentious issues in the context of the relationship between health, mental health and the rights of persons with psychosocial disabilities. So I think it is important to reflect also on what are the global challenges or what issues are very, very pertinent to um, persons with psychosocial disabilities uh, globally. And I think for me, um, one of the biggest challenge, of course, is the whole issue of um, the medical model versus uh, what we call the social or the human rights model. Because more than often, um, the conversation have always moved from um, uh, treating persons with psychosocial disabilities as objects. So they have an illness that needs to be fixed in order for them to be able to participate in the society on an equal basis with others. And again, it's not that from a disability perspective that we, that we are denying there's an impairment. Yes, we agree there is an impairment, but then disability is a much broader concept. It's about the interaction between the impairment and barriers in societies which hinders persons with psychosocial disabilities from participating in the society on an equal basis with others. And I think I have to be honest and say that diagnoses are one of the most disempowering thing to persons with psychosocial disabilities because they are no longer perceived as, as right holders, uh, but rather they are, you know, basically are perceived as, as, as patient, you know, people who just need to be treated, people who just need to be cared of. And I think that's a very contentious issue, the whole discussion and tension between the medical, medical model and the social model and, you know, as we translate into the human rights model. I think secondly, and most importantly, is in terms of then also, how do we provide mental health services then because more than often, again, medication is, is, is mostly seen as, you know, the only way of, for example, addressing mental health issues. And again, I think it's a question of looking at what are right-based approach. So if, for example, people have gone through traumatic experiences, then how do we address, you know, trauma as a way of ensuring that then we are addressing 
the mental distress or the issues that they are going through in a holistic way. So I think it's very, very important. And, and, it's, and it's interesting that sometimes um, some form of treatment which is not compliant with the international human rights standard is perceived to be uh, therapeutic or to respond or used to respond to uh, treating people when they're, in when they're in situations of distress. And I think most importantly at the global level is the whole issue of the full and effective participation of persons with psychosocial disabilities through their representative organization. And I think it's only now that we are seeing an emergence of a strong movement of persons with psychosocial disabilities globally. But that more than often, again, you will see, um, again, you know, for example, in an African context, families speaking on behalf of persons with psychosocial disabilities. At the global level, you will see professionals speaking on behalf of persons with psychosocial disabilities. And I think it is important for us to reflect um, on the general comment number seven about um, the participation of persons with psychosocial disability, the participation of persons with disabilities, uh, including um, children with disabilities through their representative organization. So are we really, really engaging? And that's a big barrier internationally. I think another complex issue is of course, the whole issue of identity that I mean, across the globe, there are people who would want to be identified as persons with psychosocial disabilities. And there are people who might not be, you know, might not want to, ident to be identified as such. And again, there's a whole discussion about, so for example, in the context of COVID, of course, people have been going through a lot of difficulties due to maybe socioeconomic challenges. But again, there is a perception that, um, you know, that, we have many people with psychosocial disabilities due to the pandemic. And I think it's very, very important to distinguish, you know, the two. And, and, and probably people are going through a lot of mental health challenges and mental health distress. But then again, it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, this could translate to them being, uh, you know, sort of categorized as persons with psychosocial disabilities. Or, um, or, or for example, people who have experienced abuse and they are going through distress again, then the whole discussion around, then do they want to identify as persons with psychosocial disabilities? And in that particular case, then how do we address, for example, the trauma that we are going through, even when they don't want to identify as such? I think one of the biggest challenges, of course, globally is when um, the health professionals are seen as gatekeepers by persons with lived experiences of persons with psychosocial disabilities. And I think this is a big, big issue. And just to reflect on a couple of examples. Um, so for example, I've seen in peer support groups where a person cannot join if they don't have a diagnosis. If for example, they're not taking medication, if they're not going to the hospital, and, and I think that that for me creates um, other layers in terms of, of, of inclusion uh, and the full and effective participation. And, and that for me is, is big, a big issue. Then suddenly we have to look at the issue of, you know, the power imbalance. Um, and that, I mean, between, for example, professionals and then persons with psychosocial disability. And this is a huge issue of, of concern. And so, for example, and I've seen this, um, when different countries are legislating on their mental health laws. And then um, you will find, for example, in a room you have, you know, you, you have 30 people and probably three quarters of those particular people are medical professionals. And you're really trying to make that particular law to be compliant with the CRPD. And sort of it's, it's create a power imbalance. And, and that's, of course, is a very, very uh, huge issue. Then there's a the whole issue of medical assessment in terms of access, you know, to, for example, uh, disability related benefits. And this is also, a, you know, a, a huge point of, con uh, I mean, of, of contention that Sometimes, like even in my country, Kenya, is um, when you have to access disability benefits, then you have to go through an assessment process, which is very, very medical. And, 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 and we've always argued sometimes that um, whereas we recognize that the 
an impairment, I think for me, the focus should be much more on what kind of supports and would people require to be able to live with the other issues which are very, very important like the issue of the issue that which I have having said that I think it's important to reflect on what are the priorities at the local level and what are the priorities at the global level because sometimes they tend to be different so mostly when you are working at the grassroots level one of the things which strongly comes out is access to mental health services, especially within an African context where most people cannot be able to access mental health services. So that's a big, big, uh, that this is very, very important for people who are at the grassroots level. You know, they want to access mental health services within their communities, but I think that the discussion is always then at these um, services being uh, provided in a way that respects the human, the, the, their dignity, their autonomy, and overall, are they being provided with the human rights within a human rights framework? And I think the next thing is about um, the ability of people to build sustainable livelihoods. And I think these are conversations you'll always find at the grassroots that historically, when people with psychosocial disabilities have been highly marginalized left out of development processes, you know, or other government programs, then one of the core things in their life is, for example, the basics, the ability to, you know, get food. And so the whole issue of building sustainable livelihood is very, very important at the grassroots level. And I think thirdly, what we found to be important is also being part of that particular community, because more than often persons with psychosocial disabilities are highly excluded within their community. And I think being part of the community could mean something as simple as being allowed, for example, to attend family function, being allowed to attend weddings or funerals within that particular community. And I think this is what is anticipated of, anticipated, of course, in Article 19 of the Convention. Sometimes the priorities at the global level tends to be different at what maybe people are, you know, think is important at the grassroots level. And just, for example, to point out, for example, at the global level, what one thing which keeps on to be very, very important is um, the whole issue of compliance with the CRPD. So we have this beautiful document called the CRPD. But then in terms of providing services, in terms of developing uh, policy frameworks, then what, the, what does this mean? And I think that's, that's, that's um, quite a big discussion globally. And I think also globally is, is the whole issue of um, mental health laws. And, and again, it goes back to compliance and whether these laws can fully comply with the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And, and, and again, the whole issue of are there other alternatives or, or what I call best practices to the medical model? I think that's a big discussion that um, we really have to think beyond the medical model and see, I mean, what other um, practices are there that help people with psychosocial disabilities or people who are going through distress to be able to recover, you know, to be able to recover and, and all that. So sometimes the priorities uh, at the global level are very, very different. And also just to point out that also the priorities between uh, sometimes the global north and the global south are different. So whereas, for example, uh, I mean, the issue of forced treatment and coercion is very, very dominant um, among people in the global south. In, uh, in the global north, rather, in the global south, I think for us, it's more about an issue about Article 19, uh, living independently and being included in the community. And this also is just from an understanding that, of course, we have very little in terms of psychiatry, which is available, you know, for example, in Kenya or in other parts of 
of Africa. So also this that sometimes there's also that tension at the global level. Um, I think just to reflect then in terms of all of us, the work that we are doing, um, that it is important for us to develop effective frameworks uh, to ensure the inclusion of persons with psychosocial disabilities, you know, in our different programs. And I think that this for me can be achieved in a number, can be realized in a number of ways. So for me, it's, it's just ensuring, for example, if you have mainstream programs, then they are developed in an inclusive way. So, so for example, if it's a health program broadly, then the thing, the question would be then, um, does it include um, issues to do with, with, with mental health? And then how do we frame those particular issues? Are they in compliance with the CRPD or also even the imagined practice um, from WHO through their quality rights initiative where they are really, really emphasizing on uh, practices that are recovery oriented and of course promote human rights. And again, the other, the other thing is that if you have disability specific programs, they, the question is then how inclusive are they of persons with psychosocial disabilities. Because more than often we'll see a lot of organizations are doing disability work, but they do not reach out to the most marginalized and underrepresented groups within the disability movement. And it's important to reflect, for example, if you're having an economic empowerment program specifically focusing on persons with disabilities, then are we ensuring that you know, we are engaging and, and, and we're engaging the most marginalized and underrepresented groups in the disability movement. And if we are not, also we need to reflect what could be the systematic challenges in relation to that. That is the issue of participation. And it's important that even as we work with, for example, the cross disability movement in different countries, we need to evaluate how inclusive is the, is the movement in that particular country. Does it have, for example, persons with psychosocial disabilities? Because more than often we'll have cross disability movements in many countries, which really, really do not um, include persons with psychosocial disabilities. So I think that's, that's also something that we need to, um, to think around. And I think also to ensure that for, for me, every program is underpinned in Article 3 of the Convention. Uh, I think for me, the general principles of the Convention says it all. I mean, respect for inherent dignity, individual autonomy, non-discrimination. I mean, all those things, respect for the evolving capacity of children. I think for me, Article 3 of uh, the Convention of the general principles, I mean, is a good framework to underpin any program to ensure that then uh, we are including uh, all persons with disabilities, including persons with psychosocial disabilities on an equal basis with others. I think I'm my last point to be- disturb. Can, can I just yes. draw you to a close? Because you've brought up so many fascinating things. <laughs> I'm sure people want to respond, but no, you just said lastly, as I was saying that, so please finish. Okay, okay, lastly, thank you very much, Julian. I think for me, it's to think around, when we're doing our work, to, to think around the intersectionality, and, and, and this could be in far more in terms of, for example, of gender. And, and just to speak very specific, for example, to women, uh, in relation to women, and they're recognizing that sometimes they face, um, you know, multiple and intersectional discriminations in discrimination in terms of their participation and it's important for us to unpack that especially women in psychosocial disability and i think um lastly is the way culture especially in an african context um impact on the way we deal with mental health issues of persons with psychosocial disabilities or even how how do we look at the intersection between the youth and mental health and psychosocial disability. And I think my last point, this is gonna be the last one, Julian, is about more than often, there's a group of people with psychosocial disabilities and these are people with high support needs. And we really, really have to conceptualize what kind of supports and accommodations do we require to ensure that you know, we are inclusive, uh, that we include them in all our programs uh, that we might be implementing at various levels. Uh, thank you very much, Julia, and I think I'll stop there for now. Michael, 
Thank you. That was a really fantastic introduction to the many topics that we had wanted to raise and to explore um, today. So I, I do want to open it up for some time of discussion now. Um, I think just in, in framing a little bit what our discussions are, um, you raise the, the fact that there does seem to be something qualitatively different about the way that people with psychosocial disabilities and their representative organizations are treated both by the general population and the assumption, for example, that people don't have capacity to make decisions for themselves, and also within the disability community in countries, many of whom don't yet really include people with psychosocial disabilities. The second thing I want to just raise as a, as a framing for, um, for the questions and further discussions is that we did in this um, webinar want to include both specific issues related to working in the field of mental health and psychosocial disability, but also the fact that many of the organisations represented in the DDG work across disability and recognise the emotional and mental well-being needs of people with other disabilities within their work so we do want to give a space for people to discuss both of those issues so uh, we, we felt that the number was just about okay to be able to open up for um, questions should people want to do that um, feel free to put a hand up if you want to otherwise um, while it's quiet you might get your first question in so any anyone want to raise a point or, or ask um, Michael a question um, at this stage Silence. Okay, uh, Ma Michael, I wonder if I could um, just ask you a little bit about that, that question you raised about uh, how the broader disability movement is engaging with psychosocial disabilities. Obviously, there are many similarities in terms of rights not being respected, but there are also some differences which you, you very articulately um, pointed out. But you've worked in an international level and also at a country level uh, in this area for a while, do you think there's been some movement in, in integrating psychosocial disability as a part of the broader disability movement? Um, yes, I, I, I think we've made some, some progress in terms of um, ensuring that persons with, um, uh, you know, psychosocial disabilities are included in the mainstream disability movement. Um, um, especially, I mean, and I think this is quite visible um, uh, at the international level. But again, then for me, what, what becomes problematic is uh, when we go at the national level or when, you know, different, um, uh, different, for example, international NGOs are implementing different programs at county level. And I think more than often what we hear is that um, these organizations or this group do not or might not exist. Um, but I think for me, it's there are two issues here. First is to systematically look at why is it um, that organizations of persons with psychosocial disabilities might not be in existence in uh, certain countries. And more than often, the experience, first of all, would be of course, they had challenges, for example, being registered as persons with disabilities in that particular country. Um, secondly, I think we really need to invest more in the disability movement, sort of trying to make them understand, um, you know, underrepresented group like persons with psychosocial disabilities. And I think badly what I found to be problematic is that sometimes also as organizations of persons with disabilities, when we are engaging in spaces um, um, of, of within the cross disability movement, I think sometimes we'll come from, um, you know, the perspective of uh, the medical model and, and, and also not being, being very, very articulate. So we tend like in a, in, a, in a disability space, then we are talking more about mental health other than 
probably looking at the import, the interaction between the impairment and, and, and barrier. So that for me, I found mm -hmm. to be problematic because sometimes yeah. people in the disability movement also do not understand. They're like, wait a minute, you guys are talking about an illness and here we are talking about the disability. So it's also trying to embrace the paradigm shift to understand then how do we need to frame the messaging and, and, and what kind of messages we put in different spaces. Yeah, so, so, so those are some of my few thoughts. Great, thank you. Um, any, any other questions or comments that, that people wanted to make? I, I hope people are able to unmute themselves. They should be able to if they want to ask a question. Hi, Julian. It's um, Diane Kingston here from Sight Savers. Hi, Diane. Hi, Hi Julian. Um, Michael, thank you for a really great overview of all different aspects of international human rights law and rights-based framework and all of the issues that we've been grappling with for really quite some time. Um, and the way in which Julian framed the conversation at the beginning, talking about mental health as a public health issue versus the psychosocial aspect and the disability inclusive development is a really interesting one. And for me, it, it throws up a, a bunch of different questions. So we know that many people with mental health conditions don't self-identify as people with disabilities. And this is difficult for us working on the ground when we want to identify people with mental health conditions, but they don't want to have another label uh, that they perceive as negative disability. Mm -hmm. um, and we see that in the HIV sector as well. So the general comment number seven from the CRPD committee says that organizations of people living with HIV are also considered as organizations of persons with disabilities. And that, but they would never put their hand up and say, I'm a person with a disability. I haven't come across one yet, but you never know. Um, my other uh, point was around the CRPD and with the coronavirus epidemic, a lot of people um, including ourselves at Sightsavers, have been talking about how do we build resilience in people to be able to deal with crisis situations. But it essentially, building people's resilience to prevent mental health conditions from emerging is not aligned to the CRPD because the CRPD is aimed at people with disabilities. So I wonder how we we square that circle in a way of building resilience on the one hand um, and those people not being recognized by the CRPD. Um, you also said that diagnosis is, is often a negative thing and I tend to disagree with you. For m most people that I've come across, including myself, diagnosis can often be a huge relief um, to have a word that actually explains what's been happening to them for a very long time. I understand where you're coming from in terms of a medical model and a clinician's view, but um, for individuals, I think it can be really liberating. And my final point is Something that I've started grappling with at Sightsavers, as we've talked about mental health and we've talked about psychosocial disability and the difference between the two, and it's brought into focus a much wider aspect about the health of the mind. And in terms of having a healthy mind, that crosses into neurological issues, cognitive issues, and behavioral issues that are not usually the target audience of mental health interventions on the ground in terms of disability mm. inclusive development. Yeah. Um, 
so I wondered if you have anything to say on those points or, or, or if not, maybe Julian does, I'm not sure, but thank you for the time. Um, shall I go, Julian? Please do, yes. Um, thank you, Th thank you very much, Dan. And I think, um, so, so I'll start with, with the whole issue of, um, uh, you know diagnosis and i think for me what what we normally say so so a couple of things we say um so first is not to deny that there is an impairment so that that for me is very very important i think whether whether we like diagnosis or not we cannot you know deny there is an impairment i think for me what i found to be problematic is that there tend to be two more two two focus and i think too much focus on the diagnosis and even at the grassroots level sometimes there's too much focus on the diagnosis and then what happens is that the diagnosis is then seen as an entry point to inclusion so and that's 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 for me where i find what, what i find to be problematic so that then uh if i need to access services within my communities, then I have to take my medicine because I have a diagnosis. And I think for me, it's, it's basically looking for that particular balance and appreciating that people have different diagnoses. Some people will require medication, some will require other kind of therapies, but also making people realize that they are more than their diagnosis. And I think it is just looking at mental health as one component of who I am, but also shifting the narrative and ensuring people that understand that then beyond that, we need social protection, we need employment, you know, and, and, and all those other things. So I think the risk I've seen and even working at the grassroots with support group is that there tend to be too much focus on the diagnosis and then that in itself creates a barrier in terms of full and effective participation and inclusion um, you know, in, in other areas, uh, in other areas of life. So that's 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 basically my thought around that. Um, so in terms of building resilience around COVID um, you know, 19, I think for me it's 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 it's, it's it's a broader conversation and it's something that, that we've been trying to unpack. I, I think building resilience will, 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 will incorporate a couple of things. It's, for example, for me looking at, um, it's, it's looking at things like how we address um, social inequalities, how, for example, we strengthen we strengthen um, social protection systems, because I think for me, much of the distress is coming from the socioeconomic impact. So I think for me, it's just having a holistic approach that probably we need to build better and ensure that we have better support systems within communities. We have inclusive social protection system within communities. Um, so so it's, for me, it's basically a whole systematic change in terms of building resilience uh, as we emerge and go forward uh, past COVID-19. I think I fully agree with the issue of identity because I think even when we work in the grassroots, some people will want to be identified as people with uh, psychosocial disability and a whole lot of others will not. But I think for us, it, it just, just, just to give examples is that for us, for example, when we run a support group and provide psychosocial support and, and, and other activities, then the whole, we allow people to identify themselves the way they want, but also just to be very, very honest, explain to people that if you have to access some other services that you require, yes, it is your choice, but also if you have to require to access some other disability specific services, then you might not be able to access them as long as you don't register as a person with disabilities. So then for me, it's just holding that safe space and allowing people to identify the way without what the way they want, without creating um, unnecessary barriers and you know, also ensuring that we're able to continuously support them in their journey of recovery, but also being realistic.
sticking at, and telling them that then if you don't want to identify in this then you are not able to access um, certain services because that's unfortunately is the way the, the system you know seems to work yeah so yes those are some some Thanks, of my Marshall. initial responses um Thank the, you. There, there is so much here and you've raised some more, more interesting questions, Dan, but I'm afraid we, we do need to move on. We started a little bit late and um, I, I want to give people a chance to, to discuss in their groups. Also, there's another opportunity to ask questions and, and respond uh, after the next session uh, where we're going to hear from a number of people uh, briefly about some of the um, different areas that we wanted to focus particularly on, recognising that many of the members of BOND and DDG are um, working in, in specific kind of subsectoral areas. Uh, really, we, we asked um, these, these panelists to, to give us a very brief introduction to a theme, uh, which will then be explored in, in more depth in the breakout rooms. Um, you'll notice I turned my camera off because um, there was some problems with the, with the uh, way that the BSL interpretation um, was, was streaming. So um, I'm afraid you don't get to see my face because um, we're going to try to maximize the smoothness of, the, of, that, um, of that streaming. So um, what I'll ask is if each of our panelists can turn on the video just while they're speaking rather than, than keeping it on. Um, I'm going to very briefly introduce all four of them now um, and then I'll, I'll ask them to, to speak in turn. Um, first of all, uh, we have Mary Wickenden, who's a research fellow at the Institute of Development Studies, and she's going to be talking to us about um, the intersections between mental health, psychosocial disabilities and um, children and young people. Uh, we have uh, Marion Staunton, who's talking about um, older age, and she's from she's a humanitarian inclusion and MHPSS manager uh, at HelpAge International UK. So she also has something to say, I suppose, about the other one of the other sectors we're talking about, which is um, the intersection with humanitarian response. And we called it particularly people on the move. But uh, my colleague at CBM Global, um, Ben Adams, will be speaking to us about that, and he's our um, MHPSS um, priority area as well as a global mental health advisor for CBM Global. Um, and then finally, I'm delighted to say that Liz Ombati has been able to join us. Um, she had some problems connecting earlier, um, but she's an advocate um, who works in Kenya, working around disability, mental health and psychosocial disabilities in particular. So I've, I've moved things around to ask her to speak last so she has a chance to, to catch her breath. Um, but if it's OK, uh, Mary, um, Mary, can I ask you to start with um, a, a brief introduction about um, the intersection with mental health and children? Yeah, sure. Um, can you all hear me? Yes, yeah, I see you very well. Okay, Thanks. good. Um, okay, so I'm going to keep this very brief because what I'm what I sort of was charged to do was really just to give a, a few sort of key points. So I've I've really just jotted down for myself some of the things that pop into my head when I think about the intersection, we're thinking about children and youth or children and young people, and um disability and mental health issues. And I think the first thing that I always think is that there are just huge numbers of fuzzy boundaries around all this. And actually um, what Michael has said kind of hinted at some of that, but I think those fuzzy boundaries about who identifies as, as, as what or what kind of labels are used are even more the case with children. Um, and of course, children are and young people are even less able to say what they think about things because usually they're not really asked um, how they see themselves or what kind of difficulties they think they have. So um, I think very often child mental health difficulties are not recognized um, and also mild disability is often not recognized. And so the question is who, which children get given which kind of labels and which children are identified as, uh, as needing what kind of support and assistance. Um, so I think it's just hugely fuzzy. Um, I think there's, a, there's also the fuzzy boundary about who is a child, obviously legally from the UN perspective, it's everyone under 18, but um, children morph into young people at a certain age and then they morph into adults, but their responsibilities, depending on their context, may be much more adult looking, even if they're under 18. So I think sometimes they, they are having responsibilities that look quite grown up even though they're under 18 and that may give them um, stress and difficulty and anxiety um, which may not be recognized. Um, so I think the question of who gets identified as having what kind of difficulty is, is hugely 
um, complicated. Um, I think also there's a question for me about whether if we're thinking about children in possibly in, in a variety of different difficult contexts, where do we, of course we're interested in all children's rights and needs, but where do we start labeling particular rights and needs as special needs because for me all children have special needs it's a you know saying some children have a particular need I mean it, it, that label has always to me seemed a bit weird because all children are individual who have particular needs and I think sort of parceling out particular children can sometimes be problematic I would be much keener on a kind of much more mainstreamed improve inclusive approach where all children are provided with support and encouragement. I think also, um, and this is something that we're addressing in some of our research, children's ideas about their own well-being are often not asked for. Um, adults have ideas about what children's well-being is, but children um, don't usually get asked about what their priorities are. And so some children may be seen by adults as having a disability or having a psychosocial difficulty, but they may not, the child themselves may not see that as the main thing that they're concerned about. They may not identify as having a disability or difficulty. Um, as far as the two human rights um, treaties that are important in here, the UNCRPD and of course the UNCRC, the Children's Convention, which is much older, I think there's quite a lot of evidence that neither of those conventions serve children with disabilities or children with mental health issues particularly well. The UNCRPD only really mentions children in Article 7, specifically I mean, and the UNCRC only mentions disabled children in one article, Article 23, which is now rather old and looks very dated if you read it. So I think although children are protected by both those treaties, um, you could argue they're not very well served by either of them in a sense. Um, the other big issue for me is the confusion that is often in people's heads between, and Michael again addressed this slightly, um, the, the confusion between children who have psychosocial, behavioural, possibly mental health difficulties and children who have intellectual disabilities. Um, and people get very confused about this, about children with intellectual disabilities, learning difficulties, whatever you want to call it, and autism also have a long-term condition that um, is, is arguably not going to change that much in some ways, although obviously their lives can change. Whereas children with psychosocial difficulties may have a short-term response to a difficult situation, which may well change quite radically and, and, and a, and a long-term label may not be appropriate. And people get very mixed up, particularly if children's behavior um, looks um, as if it needs help and yet it's not clear where that behavior has come from. So of course children can have both those things at the same time. So a child with disabilities can also have mental health issues on top of their disability and again that's very not very recognized so a child with a disability who's suffering from a bereavement for instance or a trauma maybe that's not recognized enough there's some literature about children with disabilities and psychosocial difficulties but it's mainly focused around autism and intellectual disability there's not much about the mental health of other children with disabilities so that's a big gap um, a couple of other things. Um, I think the whole question of who is vulnerable and who, who is seen to be vulnerable is quite interesting. And children themselves quite often don't identify as vulnerable. They identify as strong and resourceful. And the label of vulnerable, vulnerable is one that they quite often don't like very much. Um, and then I think the impact of parental mental health difficulties are important for children. So parents who are in distress may have difficulty caring for children, particularly disabled children, as well as they might, and, and vice versa. So a child with mental health issues that might affect the parents' mental health. So there's an interaction between the parents and the children. And then lastly, I would just say that context is everything. So we've got so many different contexts that might be relevant here. So school, uh, boarding schools, particularly institutions that children might be in, adoption and fostering, being abandoned, street children, um, children who are carers of others. Um, and we know that uh, all these kind of situations can impact on children's mental health, but we also know that children with disabilities are 
disproportionately um, represented in all those groups. So there are more disabled um, children in the street than there are generally. There are more disabled children in boarding schools than generally. So context is really important. And I think I'll leave it there. Right. Well, you've certainly given us plenty to think about. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mary. And that's going to be a really fascinating group. Thank you. Um, Marion, can I ask you to say a few words about older age? Yes, indeed. Thanks, uh, Julian. Um, so I will talk very briefly, believe it or not, about old age, older age and mental health. And I'm just going to uh, maybe touch a little bit on humanitarian as well, but not in, in great detail. Well, as we know, the world um, population is rapidly ageing. And between 2015 and 2050, the proportion of the world's population over 60 will nearly double from 12% to 22%. And it's estimated that by 2050, 80% of older people will be living in low and middle income countries. Um, older people constitute a significant and growing number of those affected by humanitarian crisis. And disability is strongly associated with age, especially in these countries. And sometimes, that's not always really, I don't know if I would say embraced or acknowledged within certain sectors of uh, the disability groups in some ways, the, the reality that there are a considerable number that are older people in an older age. Um, mental health and well-being, they're as important in older age as in any other stage of life. But according to the WHO, over 20% of adults aged 60 plus suffer from mental or neurological disorders. The most common mental and neurological disorder in this group are dementia and depression, uh, which they state affects approximately 5% and 7% of the world's older uh, population. Um, Another fact that was that I'd come across and just included in here that we know already mental health um, has a big impact on physical health, physical health, vice versa. And it states that older people with physical health conditions like heart disease have higher rates of depression than those who are healthy and untreated depression in an older person with heart disease can negatively affect its outcome. Um, in relation to dementia, this has often been, you know, referred to as a hidden disability. Where, uh, worldwide, around 50 million people are living with dementia and 60% are living in low and middle income countries. The total number of people uh, with dementia is, in, is projected to increase to 82 million in 2030 and 152 million in 2050. And this is from the Alzheimer's Disease International 2019. They also released a very uh, informative report about uh, that revealed the people with dementia are being ignored in times of humanitarian crises. So these are just come some statistics that I throw out there. I'm really hoping to have a much more, you know, nuanced discussion when we get into our breakout groups. So thanks, man. Me. Thank you. Fantastic, man. That's really, really helpful in introduction. Um, next, I want to turn to um, Ben, who I work very closely with at CVM Global. Um, and obviously, um, the issue of COVID has really um, been become incredibly important in all of our work in the last um, six or, or more months now. And within within the mental health sector, um, that's that's really hugely increased the amount of, of interest in this area. So, um, Ben, can I ask you to give us a few introductory thoughts? Hi, Julian. Yeah, for some reason, it won't let me start my video. OK, I'll, I'll sort that out. You just start. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, and hello, everybody. Um, again, I will be as brief as possible and hopefully we can um, continue the, the discussion in the breakout groups. 
Um, so we know that the impact of humanitarian emergencies is harshest for people who are already in vulnerable situations um, before the crisis. And this is particularly true for people on the move. Um, so we're talking about people fleeing from their homes because of war, human rights violations, um, disasters, um, whether as IDPs um, in, in their own country or as refugees and asylum seekers internationally. Um, and it's currently estimated that there are close to 300 million um, such people um, globally. So the disproportionate impact of emergencies on um, people on the move has been described um, and I'm pretty sure I stole this from um, a, a UN policy brief, but um, as three interlinked crises, and I, th I think it sums it up quite well, although possibly isn't all inclusive of, of the, the issues that they face. Um, and these three crises obviously further exacerbate um, existing vulnerabilities. So they, they focus on health crisis, uh, socioeconomic crisis and protection crisis. Um, so health crisis, obviously, as a result of um, living conditions, um, compromise access to health services, food insecurity, poverty, etc. Um, and social economic crisis, um, resulting in rising unemployment um, and a loss of livelihoods. Um, and this has actually been really well evidenced by a decline in remittance um, and also the fact that over um, I think it's something like over 50% of people have set, are said to have lost um, any kind of meager livelihoods that they had um, before crisis. And protection crises, um, such as curtailed access to asylum, um, detention, forced returns and deportations, um, and then also people being stranded, which obviously many of us will have, will have heard about and experienced. Um, if you then look at the experience of people with disabilities, including psychosocial disabilities in emergencies, um, you know, and they experience, as we know, negative and sometimes um, hostile attitudes and behaviours, um, misconceptions, prejudice and stigmatising beliefs, um, both among their community, but also from humanitarian workers and policymakers, um, you know, such as ideas around them being dangerous or unable to make decisions for themselves. Um, and this is especially the case for people with psychosocial and intellectual disabilities. They are at greater risk of discrimination, both in the community and in accessing services and supports. So we know that persons with disabilities are particularly disadvantaged, um, and also by socioeconomic impacts of these emergencies. Um, and diminished access to, uh, this also includes diminished access to existing services um, due to the to sometimes due to the damage and destruction of existing um, infrastructure um, as a result of the crisis, but also in addition to diminished access with regards to emergency response services and supports um, due to this ongoing exclusion and discrimination, um, but also due to the insufficient capacity um, of humanitarian staff at times to, to both adapt information and communication, um, but also service delivery to the requirements of people with disabilities. Um, and this is further compounded by the lack of accessible IEC materials um, for people on the move and people in humanitarian um, contexts. Um, I think, yeah, so they're subject to restrictions. I think Michael touched on this, but, but I will just raise it again. Um, they're also subject to restrictions in being able to exercise legal capacity and make decisions, I suppose, about all aspects of life, but including um, about the treatment and services and support that they receive and would like to receive. Um, and in some cases, um, and too frequently, to be honest, um, they also can um, suffer from being constrained. Um, which obviously prevents any, any form of participation in society. When I talk about being constrained here, I mean, you know, by being institutionalized or constrained to their homes, or even in some cases being chained or, or locked into specific facilities. Um, and as I said, this prevents them from any form of participation in society um, and access to humanitarian service, and obviously violates their human rights. Um, specific to mental health and psychosocial dis disability, Mental health, as we know, exists along a continuum from mental well health, i.e. positive well-being, 
um, to mild time limited distress at times to severe mental health conditions um, and psychosocial disabilities. And emergencies can influence where people are situated on that continuum. Um, so many people who previously coped well are less able to cope because of multiple stressors as a result of the emergency. Um, so those who previously had experiences maybe of anxiety or distress um, may experience an increase in number and intensity of these and some have developed a mental health, may develop mental health condition. Um, and those who previously had a mental health condition may experience a worsening of their condition and therefore reduced functioning. So I think, and I'll stop now, but I think um, here really inter intersectionality here can quite simply be understood by considering the experiences of emergencies by people on the move or by people in general, but for the purposes of this um, conversation, people on the move and the experiences of people with disabilities jointly. Um, and one could then further lay the experiences of people with disabilities who are on the move and belong to other vulnerable groups. For example, you know, as we've heard, children and older persons, youth, um, girls and women, um, people from the LGBTQ plus community. These individuals are all at an even higher risk. And this is even worse, again, for people with disabilities such as intellectual, cognitive and psychosocial disabilities, or as I said, people um, constrained to living in residential institutions. So such intersectionality, I think, based on age and gender, ethnicity, sexuality, disability, etc., significantly worsens the negative short term and long term impact of emergencies on these people. And this intersectionality demonstrates, I think, the, you know, the real critical need for inclusion and participation, participation um, and mainstreaming in, a, in an integrated, holistic approach to humanitarian action. I'll stop there. Great. Thank you very much, Ben. And that gives me an opportunity to, to oh, well, first of all, thank you for mentioning intersectionality, because I think we recognised in designing this webinar that while it's sometimes helpful to separate um, people into groups to be able to think about certain topics in, in more detail. We don't really want to isolate people because, because it's, a, it's, it's such an important issue of interse intersectionality. So it's actually one of the questions that we wanted to raise in the group discussions. Um, and so we'd be interested to hear if there's any feedback on that later. Yeah. Okay, so our, our last panelist who I'm going to invite now to um, speak is Liz Ombati, um, who, as I said, is, is an uh, um, advocate from Kenya. Um, and she's going to talk about um, her um, experience and gender. Liz, if you can put your camera on, it'd be nice to see you. Thank you, Julian. Uh, can you see me? Very well, thank you. Go ahead and we can hear you well too. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. And I'm so happy to be with all of you today. I had a slight um, <laughs> hectic time in the morning, but I'm happy that I'm here and, and we're going to discuss issues around gender. So we're going to talk about, you know, women, men, our experiences around um, issues to do with mental health, you know, mental well-being, psychosocial disability. So as a start, I'm not really going to go into statistics, you know, to talk about, as we know, the disproportionate impact, you know, for example, women with psychosocial disabilities, the violence they will suffer in institutions, for example. So what I want to do just right now is just share some thoughts around my experiences and experiences of my peers, both men and women, and we can further this discussion um, in the breakout uh, room. So for me, I have identified as a woman with a psychosocial disability four years now. Um, I have um, acknowledged my mental health experiences. And for me, it was fine to say back in the years that I cope with a mental health condition. So I used to wonder that until how long do I say I'm coping with a mental health condition? You know, would it be 10 years? 15 years or a lifetime, you know? So I had that diagnosis in 2009 and back in the year, you know, what I really thought was critical for me then was find a magic pill because to my mind, I, I, I thought that there was normal and, and I needed to feel that normal. 
so and and i feel that i lost quite a, a lot you know in terms of work and employment not keeping jobs you know until 2016 when i was introduced to the crpd the convention on the rights of persons with disabilities and i started viewing as an individual just viewing my experiences differently um you know and it was more of back then what i used to, to see mental health is it was like a personal burden so i started viewing my experiences from a communal perspective that um, it's okay to be different you know and what supports could i be given as one who had a mental health condition then that what supports could i be given to thrive in the workplace in society in relationships for example okay so for me sometimes i say that that was my light bulb moment when i was told about the social model of disability and that we should be able to look at barriers that are there in our environment and see that then how are we able to dismantle these barriers or just have supports given to us you know and and for me since then four years that is why i'm saying that for four years since my knowing the whole um import of the crpd then i identify as a woman with a psychosocial disability but then i often ask like is it the same for for everyone like for men and women who experience mental distress either over long periods of time or periodically so at this point in time, is it wellness? Is it well-being that matters or it's identity or, is, or it's both, you know? Is it easier, for example, just thinking through for a woman who experiences a manic episode after delivering her child to view these experiences as ordinary stresses of childbirth, you know? But what happens when she gets another manic episode after one month and these are real experiences and she has to be admitted in a mental institution with her child, which is not really ideal. And those are the challenges again on issues to do with institutionalization and lack of support at the community level, you know? Um, so for, for such a woman, the, does it matter that she will identify as one with a psychosocial disability, you know, or does it even matter? Will the most important thing be at that point to support her in her distress? Yeah, then even after leaving, if this episode passes, will she be trusted? We, we've heard about, you know, that persons will be viewed as different maybe after leaving a mental health institution. So will she even be trusted as a mother or as a worker? You know, for example, I also reflect about a man. Let's say this man, he walks for, for 42 kilometers. Um, and in his mind, he thinks he is a president of a country. So he's, he's walking to a march out parade. Okay, so and as he walks along the road, he's, he's risking his life, obviously. But still, his identity is threatened. You know, for example, when he's finally found by his relatives, Will be taken into a mental institution one way or another so it will be said that she is a danger to himself he's exposing himself to danger so he might be taken to an institution and his life could actually change by the fact that he's in an institution for a short period of time or a long period of time and after that then we start asking will he be trusted less you know will he be trusted as a family man yeah, so for me, when I see it countless times, I've been a member of a peer support group for many years now. So when I listen to peers narrating their experiences with mental distress, so when they say, for example, when someone says that they look forward to taking the antidepressants because it makes them feel human again, and I ask them, you know, is it medicine that makes you happy? But they say then without medicine, they could not do anything. Without medicine, they say they're disabled. So I ask again, like for you, the notion of disability, is it someone who cannot work, for example? And they say, yes. So if they're not able to do much, they, they have disability, that are with disabilities. So reflecting on all these issues and different perspectives on how people, my peers, women and men experience or how they view their perspectives. Um, and, looking again at peer support and the role that peer support has played in my life vis-a-vis -vis if i didn't have this peer support you know what would that mean for me yeah so looking at issues to do with identity well-being disability for me i feel that we have to go back to the very inherent thing that everyone has that we have dignity that we have dreams 
that we have desires. And I think the closest we can get to even starting to answer some of these questions is getting to know what are the dreams of people and how, how do we support them in all their different identities to actually you know, achieve these dreams that they hold dear. So that is where I want to stop and just um, know that in the breakout session, we'll have more discussions on all these issues, especially as regards men and women and the different intersectionalities as regards this topic. So I want to stop there, Julian, thank you. Liz, wonderful, thank you so much. I think you really raised some of the quite profound questions that have actually been touched upon a number of times in the other talks as well around identity and how people are viewed in the community. Um, and this tendency for a label, I think it occurs with all disabilities, of course, but there's something about psychosocial disability, I think that devalues people in communities and often is even an episode is remembered and, and continues to echo down people's lives and makes it difficult for them to participate. So thank you so much for, for raising that in such a, a thoughtful way. Okay, so before we go into our um, groups, it'd be um, good to have an, a, a brief opportunity for anyone else who wants to ask a question. Um, so um, there is a little notice here um, also saying that if anybody needs um, the BSL interpretation that that is taking place within the children's section. Um, so um, any questions that people want to um, raise now before we move into the breakout groups? Si silence is, um, is uncomfortable. Maybe everyone's very keen to get into the discussions about their own particular areas. Okay, I think we, we are a little um, short of time. So if there isn't um, any particular um, questions that people want to ask at this point, it, it's an opportunity to spend more time in the breakout groups and also to spend some more time at the end. I'm talking again in plenary. Um, so I am reliably informed that people have all been allocated to the breakout groups. Um, I've done this a number of times now on Zoom and it works very well. You'll have a box appearing up on the screen saying move to a breakout group that you've been allocated to. Um, each of those groups will have a, um, a person who's one of these panel chairs or, or one of the uh, main organizers to facilitate that. Um, and I will, um, I will um, ask the uh, bond um, facilitator now to do that and speak to you all again in about That is something I am digesting. <laughs> well, I only had four, if that helps. <laughs> Does that, that include you, Ben? Um, like, was yes. It, okay, right. Okay. Yeah. I had four as well. That, that was what we um, saw in the signing up, was that um, the older age and the people on the move group had fewer people um, who were signing up to that group. Mm -hmm. And that's a shame because we all probably, hopefully, get to the older age. So exactly. it does concern us all. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Sylvie, yes. you're right. <laughs> yeah, which I, I think is a very powerful way to um, to think about um, older age. Actually, is that we're all on our way, and it's worth our our while investing in um, good services and good, you know population attitudes um, for when we get there yeah and good data a, a good assessment because within the humanitarian sector we still are trying to improve on collecting information on older people 
Yeah. You stop at 59, if not younger, and then it's like, well, what's after that? Yeah. And different, yeah. different types of older age. There's the young old and the old old, believe it or not. Um, I was going to say, if you're not here, put your hand up. Um, my assumption is that all the groups um, should have come back by now because that was the, the clock was ticking automatically for people to do so. Um, and we, we have limited time. So uh, in, in feeding back, I don't think we need to hear a, a full exposition of all the things you discussed. But if there's just one major theme or point that came out of your uh, meeting that you're able to feed back, that would be they're really fantastic. I hope everyone found their discussions helpful uh, and the opportunity probably to speak to some other people who speak who work in a similar kind of sector. So um, may maybe I can start with you, Mary, you're at the top of my screen. Um, maybe I should ask one of my co-conspirators to, to report back. I have written notes, but I don't really want to be in charge. So would someone else like to report back a couple of points? We had a very good discussion. I can see this. Uh, yeah, I'll do it. Um, so um, we started the conversation with a question around um, labelling being slightly more complex with children um, and that leading to kind of lifelong um, perceptions of themselves, but also and other individuals' perceptions of them. Mm -hmm. And we, we um, talked about kind of uh, agency of children, really, and the ability for them to um or the, the fact they don't necessarily perceive themselves with labels and that that can be actually something that comes as a surprise to them or could be quite damaging and um, and then through that we were talking about you know cultural and sexualities around children and the voice of children and, and um, children's ability to kind of self-identify and that being kind of a big thing in our sector and then kind of finally we talked about the role of parents really and how parents can not only um, maybe block the voice of children, but actually by engaging parents in the correct way around around these issues, you can actually empower children quite a lot through the parental mm. movement. Mm. Uh, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, and if I can move on maybe now to uh, Ben or Ben's group. Yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we had some really um, interesting points were raised, but uh, we could have done with more time, but then probably could have done all day. Um, I went rogue slightly and I, I, I posed the question around is, do people think disability is a useful con concept in the context of people um, on the move um, and brief time limited to stress? Um, and again, we didn't come up with a definite answer um, because this is, you know, a, an ongoing debate, I think, among everybody. But there were some really valid points. And I think one of the good, I think one of those was around how there's, there's benefits to it. Um, and but there's also risks attached and um, there's, there's negative negatives to it as well. And maybe that actually our role as people working in um, development and in humanitarian action is to negate those risks and to reduce um, the negatives attached with that mm -hmm. so that people are facilitated to avail of the benefits um, but with none of the, the, the negatives. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. And other than that, um, one thing that came up when we talked about other considerations around intersectionality was that we really need to be more mindful um, of background um, and culture and context. Um, so almost looking at this uh, as a component of intersectionality, uh, um, even if it's not such thing, you know, even if it doesn't imply vulnerability, um, but but how but how that intersects with with these considerations. Um, and then Stephen um, from from Uganda had some really good points to make just around the need to um, ensure that these types of intersectionality and these vulnerable groups um, are included in policy and guidance at local level um, mm -hmm. and not just globally. Um, and that this practical guidance about how to support these, these groups um, and also a need to create a platform um, for people um, that we're talking about, you know, from these multiple vulnerable groups um, to engage um, with decision makers um, and to participate in decision making. Um, and finally, um, we had some really good points just around how access is key. So we, we spoke and Michael had some really good points around labeling, 
Um, and the fact that even, you know, whether or not you agree with that um, and people being put into, you know, um, the box of disabled or having a mental health um, label, um, that actually in a lot of these contexts where we work, um, we don't then go the further, the next step and ensure that we're providing the appropriate services to go with that, to go with that. Mm. Um, and that really we need to make sure we're following through for, for you know the full continuum. Um, but yeah, there was more, but but I'll stop there. Okay, thank you, Ben. Um, Marion. Uh, thank you, Julian, Hello. and a big thanks to Jessica, Paul, and Sylvie who are in my group. And if they want to add in anything that I may miss, that's fine. But I, I will just condense it. Uh, we just started off generally with, you know, let's look at this intersection, interrelationship between older age, well-being, disability, and mental health. And um, the first point that we kind of kicked off with is is the fact that, you know, you, the most common, you know, cause uh, of far impairment is that we grow older. It's not the case that it's a natural part of growing older. There's other factors involved. But the, the, the reality is that there is a significant percentage of older people that will have disabilities that impact on their lives. Um, one of the things that we did discuss that so were really warming up uh, when it came to an end was in relation to diagnosis. And um, that we had an interesting, we just started a really interesting discussion about that. And um, Paul shared with us um, his thoughts on it and his experience and the idea that in some ways, you know, there isn't much more you can do from a diagnosis. And he was sharing that in relation to a question he had with his wife, who's a pediatrician, diagnosing, say, a child with autism or on the autistic spectrum. What can you do then? Not very much in that situation from a medical point of view. But then uh, the rest of us started to look at, particularly in a humanitarian context and in certain countries, a person, an older person having an official diagnosis of a disability can actually increase their access to other resources. And then uh, Sylvie was touching on the idea that with diagnosis, maybe the, the problem is more to do with the attitudes and stereotyping, the negative kind of attitudes that come with it rather than per se being, being given that diagnosis. And, mm -hmm. um, and then I was talking about in some situations in my work where families do not understand why uh, a parent is behaving in a particular way. And if they do receive it may not be, uh, you know, a, a, an official diagnosis that it's dementia, but that dementia is explained to him, them and that these behaviors are in relation to that condition and somewhat out of their control, that it can help them in their understanding and maybe even tolerate, I can't think of another word, the behavior better. That's it in a nutshell, and um, I hope I've shared all we discussed. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Marion. Um, and finally, over to Liz to share our discussions. Um, I'll really call upon you, your support, Julian. First is to say thank you really to, to the team, to my team and the, the whole um, arrangement where I felt really, um, it's, it's a safe space to, to um, have this discussion. So I've really enjoyed that bit and I'm glad for that. So our uh, a group around gender, so many things came up and we spoke about issues to do with um, how women, um, okay, looking at, injustices or socioeconomic impacts at the community level and how mostly women will be affected. But again, looking at women with disabilities and the disproportionate impacts they face, for example, looking at gender-based violence and how that would affect women with disabilities, for example. So we spoke uh, uh, in depth around that, ensuring that intervention 
interventions uh, should really look at these intersections by importantly looking at groups that are most likely to be marginalized, more so women with disabilities. And also um, the point around the continuing, the, there should be a continuing discussion around breaking barriers when there are so many silos, like there's gender here, there's disability here, you know, where everyone is guarding their space, that how do we ensure that we are able to see the connections uh, between these two groups and just ensure that we break these silos and just work together, recognizing the um, marginalization of women with disabilities, for example. Over to you, Julian, and the team. <laughs> Anyone else, anyone else in the team who wanted to um, add to Liz's points there? My group. Okay, the, the only thing I would add really, um, Liz, is something that was mentioned in the chat box that Ben, ben added uh, after he'd finished speaking um, around invisibility. And this topic also came up for us that there, there's a tendency, particularly I think actually it happens a lot with children with intellectual disabilities that they tend to be hidden in communities. And we had a discussion about how you go about raising the profile of those people who are invisible. Um, and a, a topic that, that was also talked about in one of the groups around culture. I think Ben also mentioned about culture and how a lot of intersection initially with people with psychosocial disabilities and their communities, especially in, in relation to healing, um, is around traditional um, healing and traditional uh, attitudes towards mental health problems, um, which often was, of course, perceived as, as spiritual. So I think in the international development space, we really need to become um, very adept at understanding the, the cultural overlay of these issues and who are the key people in communities we need to engage with if we're going to do a good job of, of, of changing attitudes and behaviours um, and allowing people who tend to be uh, either completely invisible and hidden um, or not really noted and, and acknowledged um, in their voice, um, to give them a stronger voice and, a, and the ability to, to chart their own way within the community, um, going right back to the very beginning of what Michael said about the um, CRPD being something that has a, a wide range of different um, of different ways that that um, people can seek their human rights in common with the rest of the population but in many of the communities where he's working he, he really emphasized the, the community participation aspect um, of that and, and that invisibility and separation um, happens at community level and, and also to a certain extent in in our sector and our efforts to um, engage in, in disability we often miss out psychosocial disabilities Okay, um, we've had really fascinating um, conversations. I wish I had had an opportunity to go into some of the other rooms, um, but unfortunately our, our time is up now. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers. Um, thank you, Michael, for your really fantastic and very rich introduction to the topic um, and to our four um, panelists who, who were able to, to share the, their particular insights into the, into the separate um, sectors that we wanted to go into in more depth. I hope everyone enjoyed the session um, and I'm going to just hand over now to um, Lauren to close for us. Yeah, I won't take up much time. Just again, massive thank you um, to our speakers and to Julia and Gina who have taken a lot of time organising this. Um, we will send around a note um, that summarises the conversation so that you can forward that on to people who weren't able to come or just review the sessions that you weren't involved in and do keep an eye out for the kind of future ddg learning events that will kind of come up over the next two months for everybody i hope you have good afternoons and thank you for joining